Next, we're going to talk about available for sale securities. Companies report available for sale securities at fair value. The unrealized holding gains and losses related to the changes in value for available for sale debt securities are recognized as other comprehensive income and are reported as a separate component of stockholders' equity until they're realized. So until they're actually sold and there is a for real gain or a loss. At each reporting date, available for sale debt securities are reported at the fair value with an adjustment to the unrealized holding gain or loss equity account. A fair value adjustment account is used to record the difference between fair value and amortized cost. When sold, a realized gain or loss is recognized in an amount equal to the difference between the amortized cost and the selling price. By using other comprehensive income, a separate component of the stockholder's equity, then we normalize and do not impact the income statement until there actually is income associated with the sale of these securities. Now remember, available for sale securities are actually a security that is, sits in the middle intent-wise. There's no pure intent to hold them until maturity and they're not, you know, uh, being held strictly for trading purposes. So let's take a moment and look at an example illustrating just one security to simplify the concept. So we have Grafco Corporation who purchases 100,000 10% five-year bonds on January 1st, 2016. Interest is payable on July 1st and January 1st. The bonds sell for $108,111, which results in a bond premium of $8,111 an effective interest rate of 8%. Grafco records the purchase of the bonds on January 1st, 2016. So we have the original debt investment at cost of $108,111 and the cash payout of $108,111. We will have a schedule of interest revenue and bond premium amortization. Uh, if you'll recall in our last one, it was a discount. This time we're gonna show it as a premium using the effective interest rate method. So the entry to record our interest revenue on July 1st, 2016 is <clears throat> as follows. On July 1st, 2016, we are going to receive cash of 5,000. We have here, let's actually go back and look at this. <clears throat> our interest revenue, our cash received is always the same. That is a part of the bond indenture. The interest revenue though is not. That is because we are working with a yield of 8%. With a yield of 8%, we apply that to the carrying amount of the bonds and we determine what our interest revenue is for that specific period based on six out of 12 months because these get paid twice a year. The difference between the cash we receive and the interest revenue is going to be allocated to our bond premium amortization. We then remove that from the carrying amount of the bonds and it lowers it to $107,435. We continue this process for each of the periods in which we will receive interest using the effective interest rate method. And at maturity of 1-1-2021, one, one, we'll have a carrying amount of our bonds of 100,000, which is the amount that we will receive at the date of maturity. So using the 7-1-2016 bond payment 
or receipt of bond payment. We will receive cash of 5,000. We will re reduce our debt investments by $676. We'll recognize interest revenue of $4,324. On December 31st, 2016, we need to recognize the interest revenue and the interest cash that would be received in our end of year adjustments. So we have interest receivable of 5,000. We have debt investment a reduction to it is $703. And then we have interest revenue of $4,297. The total interest revenue for 2016 is $8,621, although we will have received or have as a receivable a total of 10,000. And that is because we paid more than the face value. We paid premium prices for this bond because it has a 10% interest payment attached to it, but current yield is at 8%. So to apply the fair value method to these debt securities, let's assume that on December 31st, 2016, the fair value of the bond is 105,000. So we will have, <clears throat> A, we have a current value on 12-31-2016 of 106732 We reduce from that the $105,000, and that means that we need to re reduce the book value with a fair value adjustment of 1732 that will go to our unrealized holding gain or loss equity account. Remember, that's in the stockholders equity section as an element of other comprehensive income for the current period. Now, it often the case is that we actually have multiple securities. We don't usually only have one. So if we have what's called a portfolio, meaning we have more than one security, uh, such as the case with Herring Shaw Corporation here, they have two of them that are classified as available for sale. <coughs> we would have a schedule illustrating what our current amortized cost and our fair value is, and what the unrealized holding gain or loss attributable to each are then we would ascertain what the fair value adjustment is for the portfolio. We wouldn't necessarily have to do this for every single security. We would do it on a portfolio basis in one entry. So the entry that we would enter December 31st, 2017, to record this unrealized holding loss is a debit to the unrealized holding gain or loss account for equity of 9,537 in an equity account of $9,537 and the fair value adjustment of $9,537. Now, if the company does manage to sell the bonds before maturity date, they have to make entries to remove from the debt investments account the amortized cost of the bonds. Any realized gain or loss on the sale is reported in the other section of the income statement. To illustrate that, we'll continue to use Herring Shaw, who sold the Watson bonds on July 1st, 2018 for $90,000, at which time it had an amortized cost of $94,214. So they have a $4,214 loss on bonds. We receive cash of $90,000. We have a loss of 4,214 
And then we close out the debt investment with the $94,214 credit, which is equivalent to the amortized cost currently of the Watson bonds. Herringshaw will report this realized loss in the other expenses section of the income statement. And assuming that there were no other purchases and sales of bonds in the period, their end of year information would be prepared in this manner. They would actually show uh, what the remainder of their amortized cost for bonds are. That leaves the Anacorp, Anacomp Corporation 10% bonds with an amortized cost of 200,000 and a fair value of 195. They have a current unrealized loss of 5,000. There's a previous fair value adjustment of $9,537. So to bring that $9,537 to 5,000, we would have to debit the fair value adjustment account to $4,537. Herringshaw makes that entry as a debit to the fair value adjustment and a credit to the unrealized holding gain or loss equity accounts. So let's look at the financial statement presentation that we would have related to available for sale securities. The end of the year, if we are between interest payments and we have accrued interest, we would have an interest receivable based off the security uh, portfolio remaining. We have 195,000 fair value for our debt investments available for sale. We would have an accumulated other comprehensive loss of 5,000, which is in the stockholders equity section. We would have whatever interest revenue occurred during that specific period on our income statement. And a current loss on the sale of investments of $4,214. Now remember that goes back to the Watson bonds because they actually sold. They were realized. They are no longer a part of our portfolio. When that happens, then we move out of that stockholders equity section and we have realized losses that reflect on our income statements.